Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Juliet and Kelly Starrett, the husband and wife team behind The Ready State, the company that pioneered mobility training. In this episode, we talk about the evolution of their business, from a CrossFit gym to YouTube channel and a variety of coaching products, including a digital subscription, educational courses, speaking, and consulting. We also discuss the fitness industrial complex as it relates to the booming fitness industry, but widening health gap, along with how Juliet and Kelly think about increasing access and improving outcomes. A quick reminder before we get into today's show. Every Tuesday, we send a weekly newsletter filled with insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Join other decision makers and industry operators by subscribing at insider.fit.co. Let's get into it. Juliet, Kelly, welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. We're so pumped to be here, Joe. I don't know. I mean, it may be too soon to say thanks. Look, yeah, here we go. We'll see how it goes, right? <laughs> Listen, I think a lot of folks have certainly heard of you, followed the business, know about the Ready State and, and all of its different evolutions. But to kick things off and maybe kind of hit on the high points, can you introduce yourselves and, and tell us about what you're working on? Sure. Uh, my name is Juliette Starrett, and I am the CEO of the Ready State, formerly known as Mobility Wad. And I'll let Kelly go. <laughs> I'm Kelly. I was classically trained as a physio. I would describe myself as head coach and chief content officer. We we struggle to come up with a title for him. So and this calls often, me talent. Um, often it just is reduced to talent. So we should just stick with that. You know, I get to uh, I get to do my job and do what I'm good at. And Juliet has to do everything else. Yeah, it's 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 awesome. We jammed a little bit offline about it that, you know, it's kind of Kelly, you're obviously out front. Juliet, you've been pulling the strings behind the scenes. Obviously, husband and wife working together. My brother and I have worked together for the better part of 15 years. And for us, sometimes that means, especially early on, learning the different roles, who does what, how that gets decided and you know, with two brothers, you know, maybe that come into to the brawling a little bit sometimes. Um, but what has the relationship been like in terms of figuring out on the business side, who does what, how it breaks out and, and what do those responsibilities look like today? Um, let me just start by saying that I've known Juliet for, we met in 2000. So we, we've been hanging out together for a minute and I met her at the World Whitewater Championships in Chile. So Juliet was on the US women's team and I was on the men's team. And the reason that's germane to this conversation is that I actually met Juliet in a very stressful, also peak experience environment where I got to see who Juliet was when the chips were down, when it was cold and gnarly, when we were sort of, you know, very stressed. And it turns out, you know, for us, sport has been, is a really nice diagnostic tool to understand who people are. And so, I mean, even though Juliet happened to be a world champion and we're at the world championships, da, da, da. I was like, this is a person I want to be around. And, you know, from that day for the last 21 years, Juliet has been my chief training partner. And, you know, so we have kids together. We've both gone through grad school together. We're also, we share a little bit of a common DNA as river guides, as sort of taking risk and being comfortable with risk and racing at this kind of weird professional level. So there's a lot of language and common ground that we we get together and also we're partners in our kids and our our lives. So you know, it doesn't feel too epic for us to then translate that into business. And let, let me just add really quickly, there's a couple of things on the business side in terms of roles. You know, it's almost just figured itself out because we really do have such different skill sets. I mean, I like to say Kelly's like an energizer bunny. You can like turn him on and he's so gifted and amazing in front of the camera and such a great public speaker. And he's, you know, obviously had a lot of really great ideas about movement, mobility, mechanics, right? Like he's, you know, really forward thinking in that way. And I, on the other hand, am like, I have like, I'm very practical, super organizational brain. I like to manage people. I like to get into the details and create systems. So in many ways, it wasn't even like a formal discussion we ever had to have. It was just sort of like, this is what you do. And this is what I do. And then just in in terms of like, why I think it's worked so well is that we really do share the same values. I mean, both personally, and then also sort of what our our vision for the future is, you know, again, both personally and uh, in terms of what we you know, hope for the ready state going forward. So it's really like a values, a values thing. 
Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And it's it's obvious, you know, from the outside looking at it, it's certainly worked and it's been over many years at this point and many different, I think, maybe iterations of the business. And you can speak to the, the specifics, but that was one of the reasons I was excited about chatting with you both is that, you know, from the early 2000s, you know, opening a CrossFit gym before CrossFit was really a thing, obviously Kelly being at the forefront of mobility and, and now what has evolved into kind of like this recovery um, vertical being on YouTube and being a content creator before maybe it was even being, it was called being a content creator or a YouTuber. True. Yeah. So how did these various pieces come together? And like, in hindsight, it seems like most things like this straight arrow that got you from A to B, but in reality, as you're going through this, how did it evolve? What is the, even the thought process like to see these pieces come together and, and what is it as, you know, kind of straight line trajectory as it might seem, or what was that actually like? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely not a straight line trajectory. I mean, what I'll start by saying is both our gym and what is now the Ready State, but was Mobility Wad, both were started not at all because we were trying to start a business at all. I mean, that was never in either case part of the at least initial calculus. You know, it came to the gym we had started, we'd fallen in love with like the CrossFit methodology and the workouts. We were doing them in the backyard in our flat in San Francisco. We'd invited some of our friends and, you know, the sort of impetus to find a space and formalize it a little bit is at 5.30 one morning, one of our neighbors, you know, yelled some expletives out of his window. And basically we realized that having, you know, eight people training, you know, in like a, a tight knit place in San Francisco, wasn't, it wasn't going to last for the future. So we thought, well, we're really having fun doing this. We want to create a space for our friends to do it. Let's find a space to do it. Um, and let's call it something. But again, we weren't thinking we were going to make money. I was still working as a lawyer. Kelly was working as a physical therapist, the therapist at this time. So, you know, we really sort of went out to solve a problem. And that problem was we really fell in love with CrossFit. We There's nowhere to do it in San Francisco. Where can we do it? And then when it came to mobility wad, that also sort of started out of the gym, but Kelly used to come home at night. You know, again, I'm a lawyer, not a physical therapist. You know, we'd been running the gym. The gym had gained some momentum at this point. Kelly had moved his physical therapy office in-house. And, and at that point, the gym had become a business. You know, we were actually charging money and it was, it, you know, we, it was really starting to grow and explode and we had a lot of members. But Kelly started coming home after seeing tons of physical therapy clients every day and like quizzing me like, hey, Juliet, so I had this guy today and, you know, he's been really struggling and seen every doctor and every chiropractor and, and, you know, and here's what symptoms I saw in him. And I'd be like, oh, he has tight hamstrings or, oh wow, he has no shoulder internal rotation, you know, and I'm like a total armchair physical therapist at this point, but I think, and I don't want to speak for Kelly, but I think he started to see that people were coming into our clinic with really basic musculoskeletal problems, but spending a lot of time, a lot of money, time off work, time, you know, they weren't able to do the things they love, like CrossFit or bike or run or whatever, because they had these nagging musculoskeletal injuries. And many of them maybe like 90% of them were actually totally preventable if people just number one understood how their body worked a little bit. And number two had some like basic tools to be able to, you know, work on their own movement and mobility, both in the gym or at home in front of their, you know, Netflix at night. So that was really the sort of spawn of mobility wad is we thought, well, why, you know, people don't need to come see Kelly and take time off work. Like, let's just start to put some videos on mobility, you know, on YouTube. So again, did not start at all with a business vision, business plan, or, you know, we weren't thinking about talking about raising money, none of that. We were just like, there's a problem. And the problem is nobody understands how their body works. Nobody has literally any tools in their toolkit to sort of take a crack at fixing themselves. And we actually have some ideas about how we can help people do that. And that was pretty revolutionary at that point. And, you know, we didn't, we put videos on YouTube. We didn't like tell anyone that we were doing that. They just somehow people found that. Yeah. I think, you know, there's a couple things that are worth highlighting. One is that if you give people the right information, they'll make better decisions. Right. And second, Julie and I have always set out to solve problems, problems that were interesting to us, problems that, you know, made our lives easier or our friends' lives easier. And really like, I think, you know, think globally, act locally is a great phrase, but now people are like, I'm setting out to take over the world and X, or I'm, and I'm like, well, how about your neighborhood? How about your friends? So we became really good at CrossFit in San Francisco and coaching in San Francisco. And we were for many years, the best gym in the city, the best gym in the Bay. We'd win that award over and over again. And we were in a parking lot 
right? <laughs> Which really made it very crystal clear to us that it wasn't about the nicest bathrooms and the towel service. It was about our customers and their interactions we had with them and, and our mm-hmm. dedication to helping them meet their needs. And when we when you sort of roll that out a little bit, it's difficult to even remember a time when the iPhone didn't have a video camera, but that was when we started making content. When we made the first mobility wide video, there was no video feature on the iPhone. And so what we we kept looking around and saying, well, what are the best tools available to us? And look at this interesting tool, and this will allow us to solve a problem. Instead of leading with, here's my branding, here's my thing, I'll backfill. You know, what we worked on is we had a service and a model first. We started teaching a course in 2008 and the bar was very low. And I, and I will, we have to sort of, you know, name the devil in the room, which is, man, we were in the right place at the right time. And instead of having 10,000 hours, we had 20,000 hours of experience. And so we definitely were able to be in the right place and, and we're hyper obsessed with this stuff. But also we never ever set out to what I'll say is create an industrial fitness experience or industrial fitness product. And the, the definition of industrial fitness is to make money. And don't get me wrong, you should get paid and you should have you know health insurance and 401k. But we set out to have a quality of life and a values-based business and have really interesting relationships. And lo and behold, the rest of that backfilled. And of course, you have to be sophisticated on that, et cetera, et cetera. But that was never our intention first. Like, let's develop a widget, and then let's sell it. That wasn't, I think Facebook ads have screwed everyone's head up. Yeah, there's a, a lot in there and and even some things that I think about, I mentioned my brother and I, like our particular journey, like we started training people in a park and we were training five people and then we were training 25 people and they were like, what are we going to do with all these folks? So got our first sublease that turned into a gym, eventually opened a CrossFit gym that turned into hundreds of members, took that business online. It's since evolved multiple different times into multiple different, you know, kind of verticals and opportunities, but uh, some similarities there. And then the other thing, which was this idea of, and I, I wanted to touch on this maybe later in the conversation, but since you mentioned it, the industrial fitness complex, we've, we've kind, of, kind of written about it and talked about it as even broader, the industrial wellness complex around yeah. immunity and mental health and meditation and all these different things that are on one hand, fantastic and really great. But at the same time, almost a contradiction, like we're using our smartphone to meditate because we're trying to get away from our smartphone and technology that we're using. Yeah. 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 And and some of these different things where same idea with, you know, trying to improve the way that your body moves. Yes, it's good that we have these different devices, machines, whatever it is, subscriptions to help us, but you can simply watch these videos online for free and figure out how to do a lot of these things. So how do you think about being involved in the industry in so many different ways? Like what's happening now, these trends that exist and the difference between these trends and like actually helping people get better in any way, whatever their particular goal is, let's just call it health or fitness, whatever it is. But how do you kind of hold those two thoughts in your head? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Kelly and I are sort of in a mental place right now where we are feeling a little critical of our own industry, right? And I think you're right to sort of broaden the net and say wellness, because I think we're all sort of looped into that. I think what we've done is take this little vertical and the people who are in this little vertical, and we've made ourselves better. We've all gotten better abs and more jacked, and we eat more micronutrients, and we track our sleep and make sure our heart rate variability is good, and we meditate, and right? Like, Man, we are checking all the boxes, right? Those of us in this vertical. But if you look at the trends in terms of especially Americans and health, they're we're getting worse, right? Like no, when, no, I mean, like way worse. Like, like when choose choose something you choose care a about. metric. Like, choose a metric: obesity, diabetes, like, ACL injury rates, NFL preset. Like choose something and then be like, how's it working? Like, let me give you one piece of data that really is striking to Kelly and I. When we were kids in the seventies, we had a one in four thousand chance of being diabetic. One in four thousand. And now kids today, and this is kids today, regardless of socioeconomic class or color have, your skin have a one in four chance of becoming diabetic. So, I mean, you know, again, we we always try to be like solution focused people, but I would say today we've added a ton more input and complexity to this vertical, which is working for the people for whom, for people who relate to it or are passionate about it. But man, we have left behind 
a giant amount of people who just can't relate. It's too complicated for them. You know, most people are never going to ice bath and, you know, sleep with magnets under their bed. And I mean, I don't know, I could go on and on about like trends that have happened in this business that just aren't relatable to average people. So I think, you know, our our way of trying to deal with that is to be like the back to the basics people <laughs> um, and just keep trying to push the basics metric, the message over and over again. Like, man, you don't need to track your heart rate availability. Like try to get 10 hours of sleep a night. Like try to eat a few vegetables during the day. You know, maybe move a little bit. Like, you know, you need to cross it. Like maybe just walk. I mean, we really have, it's been interesting how we've sort of, you know, even five, seven years ago, we were way more aggro. Um, and we just find the more that is added to this space from a business standpoint, the more like reasonable Kelly and I are becoming. And we're trying to bring more people into this fitness wellness community by making it relatable somehow. And let me let me dovetail and just say that we've always come to the re- realization that through high performance, through elite performance, we could see what best practice was. So if we're talking about the complexities of being a really diverse, sensitive, psychoemotional human, and not just can you do more thrusters, like, well, it turns out that a how you walk into our gym and being greeted made you feel like you were in a community and safe and seen and talking about nutrition and sleep. So we've been talking about the basics of good function because it was tied directly to performance. And so suddenly when we were invited into the NFL or the NBA or NHL or Olympics or the, you know, the military, I mean, that every time we got dropped into a high performance environment, we got to see everyone's dirty laundry and we got to test theory, test models. And we've been doing this for a decade and a half. And what we came up with more and more is like, okay, here is what we're learning about what high performance looks like. But if we're going to actually fulfill the promise of science, which is to improve humanities, then we need to take what we're learning in fitness and transform society. And we haven't done that to Juliet's point. And so what we see is like, it's, it looks like a, a schism between sort of people who have and people who have not. And we're lead, there's, the gap is growing and it's up to us to try to do a better job saying, here's what we've learned in these high performance environments. Now we better translate it back to society because it's going to impact us all. And let me just tell you before you move on to the next question, how far a field is kind of a funny story. I feel like we have gotten a bit in this industry. So this year for April Fools, we have a friend who owns an alcohol company and he decided that we wanted, he wanted to do this April Fool's Day joke. Where this, is me. Gonna, this is Kelly, all Kelly, total credit. But he wants to do this April Fool's Day joke where we fake sell a tequila called Leopard's Tears, which is like infused with collagen and a bunch of other stuff. Aminos. Aminos and whatever. Vitamins. Else. It's yeah. a recovery tequila. It's a recovery tequila. That's how we put it out there as a joke. And we make a video about it. We launch it on actual April 1st. And like most people thought it was serious and a real thing. And I thought, man, like to me, you know, we really were completely kidding. And, you know, in in our view, if you want to have a tequila, it's decidedly not a recovery thing, but like, go for it also. No, no, eat a steak, have some blueberries, drink some tequila. Whatever. So quit um, Quit trying to like hack, modify everything. Yeah. So, you know, for us, that was. So to me, it just was kind of like tequila. It was a funny, very clear representation of like how far, sometimes we've missed the mark in this industry because like, what are we even talking about here? (laughs) Listen, we, I, I say it, I try to come back to it over again. And, you know, as much as we write about these various trends and businesses, we try to call, you know, bullshit out where it is. And it's, it's difficult because sitting in it amongst other operators, it's obviously like you don't want to put people down for trying to build a business. You don't want to put them down for trying to help people in the many different forms. But it, it is definitely true that, you know, the simpler things are, the closer it is to truth and, um, and the more affordable it is or the fact that you don't need to charge anything for it because it is so true and basic. But then the more complex things are, the more complicated it is, the more you can charge for it, right? Because there is some answer that you have. So on that side of it, how do you balance building a business around these things and charging money for them with the fact that like, hey, we could just give this away for free and have a maybe a bigger impact. So how have those things kind of played out in parallel? 
Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we struggled with that early on when we first decided to monetize uh, Mobility Wad in 2013. And, you know, the reason for it, uh, the reason we did it, and, and I'll tell you, we looked at a couple models. I mean, at that time, it was, you had two choices. It was either, you know, put ads on your video on YouTube or move to a subscription model. And I will say we were hands down the first company in like all of fitness to actually try a subscription model. I mean, we really were like, like there was like no tech to even support the ability to do, you know, everyone just now thinks, oh yeah, I could just get this membership plugin and this and this, like those things didn't even exist in 2013. So we had to work hard, but, you know, ultimately um, for us as a family, we realized that this was expensive and taking us a lot of time to make these videos. And with each passing year, there was sort of a higher expectation of quality, right? Like early on, we could have literally the worst audio quality, no titling on the video whatsoever. I mean, we had a video, I'll tell you on YouTube early on, that someone emailed us and said, hey guys, just FYI, you have this video on YouTube, it has like 100,000 views and it's called IMG underscore 0007, right? So this is like what rookies we were, right? Um, but we, you know, for us to just personally, for us to be able to like, uh, you know, not lose money putting this content out in the world. At some point we were like, we have to actually charge for this because it's, we're taking time. We're actually now needing to hire people to help us. You know, we're like having to quit our other jobs to be able to sort of meet the demand. So, I mean, part of it was just totally personal. Like, Hey, if we want Mobility Wad to continue, we have to charge. But what I will say is, you know, our first product was $7.99 a month. And we were really like, man, it'd be awesome if we could get a thousand subscribers because then we could basically just break even and like keep doing what we're doing in other, you know, other spaces. Again, not at all thinking that this would blow up and become a way bigger business. You know, and we actually just upped our price when we we moved to the ready state to fourteen ninety nine, just to kind of be consistent with the market. But again, because with each passing year, right, we're hiring more people. Our tech stack is getting more complicated. We really do have to play the big marketing game these days. So, you know, again, our mission has never been to like make millions of dollars you know, have some fancy exit. We are a totally bootstrap family run company. We've never taken a single investment dollar. And so for us, we're trying to really have that, that helps us sort of reconcile having like a values-based business, right? We're family owned. We don't have investors. We still have very low price product at $14 a month. So we really feel like, man, in one month, you could subscribe to the Ready State and learn a ton about your body and be like ready to go. So we feel like from a price standpoint, we're trying to be fair so that we're accessible to a lot of different people. And, you know, I think that's how we reconcile it. But, you know, we're not in the game of, trying to become a hundred billion dollar company and, you know, have a fancy cool exit and, you know, be like Silicon Valley rad, awesome people. Like we really are just trying to help people and offer, offer products that people can really use and can change their lives or help them get out of long-term nagging pain and injury and like pay our own mortgage. You know, like that's kind of what our mission is. The other thing is we're at a place now where we've been planting seeds for a long time. So, you know, some of the young lieutenants and captains are now majors and colonels. Um, some of the young interns are now head of the you know, football program. And so we're just coming to the place where, you know, we have a, a general rule in business and the Internet, same, which is don't be a dick. You know, and that's actually, you know, one of the things that we you'll never see us do is we don't talk bad about other people's products. We don't talk down. We don't we don't talk about what other people are doing as a way of blowing up our business. We always talk about what we like and we definitely shine a light and try to bring as many people along with this with us as we can. But the glacial pace is the breakneck pace. And I think what one of the problems is we see people get hot and it's easy to see people get hot. And I think we heard like Jay-Z talk about this with Oprah. You know, he said, you know, what's she asked him, what's the definition of long-term success? And he said, performing at a high level for a long time. And he's like, you'll see people get extremely hot. Knees over toes guy is about as hot as you can right. get. Maybe he's starting to cool off a little bit. People have like had their, of their fill, but that's a great example of someone who got super hot. And for us, we don't get threatened by people being successful. We don't get threatened by people having success, right? And, and getting the spotlight because we're like, see in 10 years, because putting out content and serving and, and developing programs and platforms 
it takes forever to do that. And you're going to realize that you can't do it by yourself. So what's the old model? If you want to go alone or go far, or if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go with friends. And that really, that basic model really helps us keep in mind that, yeah, we may not get every win, but we're still going to be playing better than everyone else is in another decade. Yeah. And I mean, we really, really do like honestly take the the mindset that like there's, you know, I, I mean, even from your article, which was so great on musculoskeletal injuries and sort of the market around it. I mean, as you know, like one in two Americans are suffering from some kind of musculoskeletal injury. So there is plenty of space in this market for a lot of people to be doing, you know, offering things that help people in different ways. And we feel like that having a lot of people and a lot of options for people is actually a positive thing. And it's a positive thing for us. I mean, we feel like we've learned a ton from having other people get into the space after us. And, you know, it, just like Kelly said, like, we're just trying to endure. And I think one of the things I feel the most proud of is like, we're going on almost 10 years of actually, you know, running a business um, and a subscription business that's content-based, which is no joke, right? To keep churning out content and keeping it updated and relevant. And, you know, I think that's one of the things I, you know, I feel most proud of is that we have endured and we are still going. <laughs> we are, we are older and we're still excited. than the Taco Bell Doritos Loco Taco. That's all I need to know been in the game in some ways created the game around mobility and the the many evolutions of that. And I think to that point, maybe just digging in a little bit to folks that don't know. And, and maybe I think fans who have been around from the beginning have, you know, followed the content and all the different, maybe like high performance aspects of it and the intersections with CrossFit and, and athletics in general. But now as this market broadens and it becomes, there is the kind of MSK disorder healthcare intersection and now startups getting involved in that. But as it relates to this content subscription platform, what does the Ready State business entail? How big is it to whatever metrics you're comfortable sharing, whether that's headcount or users or revenue, whatever it is, but what is all involved in that business and and how are you thinking about continuing to grow it? Well, I'll start a little bit. I mean, this our subscription part of our business is a big part of our business, but we do a lot of things. It's more like, um, an, like an ecosystem right? is the way like, to think about like it. it. Yeah, it actually, and even to that, like lay those yeah. things out because I don't know that it's yeah. totally obvious yeah. from the outside. Yeah. And, and if you want to talk like in terms of revenue streams, I could do it that way. But, you know, we do have our subscription product, which is called Virtual Mobility Coach. It's $14.99 a month. And, you know, we have give or take between about 15 and 17,000 subscribers, depending on the month. And we also have a lot of group members and we don't really roll them into our subscription count. So, you know, if we were to count them, it would be much bigger than that. But but anyway, we've, we've got sort of a consistent and growing number of like dedicated subscribers. Another big revenue stream for us is we teach courses to professionals. So we teach what it's called the movement, one, movement and Mobility 101 and 102 course. Those are largely taken by practitioners like physical therapists, chiros, doctors, also and a coaches. lot of coaches. But you'd be surprised. There's actually a lot of like athletes who just want to take our course because they want to understand how their body works and move better and be a better athlete. So we we have that you know vertical in our business. We obviously have written some books. So we have the book department of our business. And we're actually going to be coming out with another big book with publisher Kanop in early 2023. So we're very excited about that. And we've got then, products. Then we sell these things called fix yourself protocols, yep. which are just for people who really aren't a subscription type customer. They just have a specific problem like low back pain or shoulder pain. Um, we realized over the years that a lot of people were coming to us and they just wanted sort of like a like a one-stop shop to solve a specific problem. And then we do sell some mobility tools and a little bit of retail. That's a smaller part of our business. We do consulting. Yeah, we have a speaking arm. We consult with professional teams. And and then we also work with some sponsors. And, and, and I'll just add that lately, yeah. what we're seeing is that a lot of people who've gotten into this fitness space with technology have suddenly realized that they're actually content creators. Like Apple's like, yeah, Apple Fitness. And they're like, oh, whoa, we, whoa, we need yeah. content to support this, right? And then you can add mirror and tempo and tonal, um, Amazon, and so what we've seen is that a lot of people reached out to us to help them solve content. So Specialized is a great example where we had a, we can, our model, which is actually a, a really a true model about how people move. It helps us to explain phenomenon, predict phenomenon. You can actually use it and, and repeat it and, 
and uh, communicate about it. But we have a, a technology that allows people to understand how to fit the bike better, right? Not make the bike fit the body, but help the body fit the bike. And so suddenly we're able to go out of our own fitness, strength and conditioning vertical and help Amazon or help specialize and create content for them around, you know, this musculoskeletal care. So that's sort of, I think, the, the big piece around what we, we offer. And, you know, it, it's, again, if you continue to do a good job in your space for over a decade and you're not a dick, you'd be surprised at the, the opportunities that will come your way. Yeah. And, you know, so it's complicated. I, I would say a lot of the other folks in our space that are like competitors, I guess, if we want to use that word, you know, they do one of those things usually, right? Like some of the people that are in our musculoskeletal space, I would say, you know, they offer a subscription product right. or some of them offer a book or some of them offer a course. Right. And so I think part of the reason that we're still here and still going is that, you know, we, we do have, you know, a ton of different revenue streams coming into our business. So, you know, our virtual mobility coach subscription part product is one part of that, but we've got a lot of other stuff going on. And I'll just add that I think part of our mindset has been, you know, we really want to transcend fitness space. Everyone has a body, you know, because we work in all these diverse fields, children's health, things like that. What we've realized or come to realize is that there's a lot of gold laying on the ground. If you just step over that little fence that is like CrossFit or fitness or functional fitness or boutique yeah. training gyms or 24 hour fitness, like you re- like, holy crap, there's a whole lot of improvement here. And it's actually not that different than our current industrial health practices or, or for-profit medicine. There are a whole lot of ailments and issues around health and wellness that are not best handled in a medical model. The medical model is really good at pathology and really good at catastrophe, but it's really fallen on its face in terms of taking care of the greater population. And again, what we've realized is, man, we really have come to understand what are good models for eating and sleeping and recovery and musculoskeletal health and care and movement out of our fitness. Let's go ahead and just drift over into that lane. And right now, while people are sort of scrapping for these little, you know, diverse, you know, there's not enough pie. Julian and I are like, there's pie everywhere. Like, let's go over there and get that pie. So that's what we really feel like is the next frontier for our business is really transcending these fitness boundaries. And you can see it even in the way we renamed ourselves from mobility wad to the ready. Yeah. And I don't want to go too far afield on your question, but I mean, if we look at the next like five years of the ready state, that's really a focus for us is how do we continue to evolve and adapt our content so that more and more diverse kinds of people relate to it and understand it? Because, you know, ultimately we think whether it's your mom or like, you know, a 24 year old CrossFit kid or whatever, we all have the same body that ultimately does really function in the same ways. And we, we often have very similar musculoskeletal injuries and issues and need need to do the same basic things to maintain our body. So, you know, our, our sort of uh, focus right now is how do we continue to make our content more accessible to more people so that we can widen the net. Now, we still think we have, a you know, we, we still want to stay in this sort of athletic fitness wellness space we've talked about, you know, that's obviously our core market. It's our teaching hospital and our test. Yeah. But we also think that there are so many people, and I think COVID has really highlighted this, you know, people have just been stuck sitting in a shrimp position in their house by themselves. And, um, you know, I think there's, you know, our mission is how do we get this information to the most people? For sure. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think the the mindset that you all have, uh, certainly a growth mindset that the opportunity, it's expansive and we want to do more and put the best product out there uh, is certainly the right one that's paid dividends. Uh, well, half, we're running a, a level two course right now and it's virtual and we do kind of um, weekly, you know, office hours and half of our participants right now are from other countries. And what you realize, you realize like, oh man, it actually is a gigantic market. And there are, there are people in, I don't know, we have 11 countries right now in this course, you know, people are at three up at two 30, three 30 in the mornings to attend office hours because they're trying to solve their thing in their own pro in their own community. So one, it's as much bigger, you know, as we continue to grow and expand, I think 
what Julian and I are, are realizing is that we have a real opportunity to, you know, transcend what we're currently doing and come back into these kind of bigger health systems. How do we ask, you know, maybe it's not about you PRing on your 5K, that's important to you, but it's less interesting to Juliet and I then, how do we create movement vital signs? How do we get people thinking about movement as a foundation of health, not just blood pressure or sleep or some of these other things? So we are now, because we're a little bit old guard, get to feel like ask a little bit different set of questions which for us are more intellectually interesting. So we keep, you know, keep able to sort of progress our own thinking at different levels. Yeah, it's it's a perspective that adds so much to the overall kind of trajectory of what's happening. And I think it's very important. And with that, and I, I could talk to you guys all day and, and really enjoy you making time, just being cognizant of the time uh, and, and, and maybe get a few more questions in here. Thinking about the audience, we do have a lot of a lot of operators, a lot of founders who are at various stages of starting their business in the broader fitness and wellness space. When you're talking about all these different opportunities and how things have evolved over time, like how have you approached building the team and how many other people are involved? And I think maybe one thing that comes along with that is how do you say no when all these various things present themselves? So that aspect of it of like operationalizing this business? Like, what has that been like? Let me take on two important filters for Juliet and I. One is that it only thing that matters is our family. That is the only thing that matters. And so we ask a lot of questions. Does this get our family more time together or less time together? And that really clarifies not burning out, not going on the road, not being maniacs. Cause you can just drive yourself to death as an entrepreneur. Am I, supporting the core mission, core mission, which is being with my family. That's super crucial. And second, are we doing dope shit with dope people? Yes or no? Like I can't, like we really, what makes it interesting for us is we get to really work at a ton with a ton of really interesting people and interesting projects and problems. That is super cool for us and keeps us our skin in the game. Does it get our time and family together? Are we doing dope shit with dope people? Now I'll let Juliet take on like, how do you grow a team? Because it really is you know, it's not just the two of us anymore. Well, well, and I will start by saying that I, we did have quite a few years in our business where we said yes to everything. And I, and, and we probably lost a bit of uh, work-life balance or life balance at that point, but I'm not sure it's possible to really grow a business as an entrepreneur. And like, I think you earn the right to say no by um, sort of like establishing yourself in a business, right? I think at the beginning, you know, if I were to advise a young entrepreneur, I would say, say yes to every opportunity because you never know, you might not be able to assess what are, what opportunities are good and bad early on in your entrepreneurial career. And so say yes to everything for a little while, crush yourself and then earn the right to say no later. So, I mean, that's what I would start by saying. I mean, we did say yes. You got to pull out at some point. You got to pull up at some point. Yeah. At some point you got to pull up and be like, okay, yeah, no, I'm not going to do X thing or no, thank you. That partnership is not, you know, it's not the right fit for us. I will say that one of the challenges for me as an individual entrepreneur is I'm really controlling and I'm also, I hate, like, I like to hold on to my money and my mattress kind of person. So it was hard for me to actually start hiring a team, but I realized at some point in the entrepreneurial journey that, you know, you can't grow a business if you don't have the right people in the right seats in the business. So we've been slowly but surely growing. And now we have you know, what looks like a normal company with like, we have a CMO and we have a CTO and I'm the CEO and we actually have an organizational chart and we have people in the right seats in the business, right? So, so between internal and agency partners, we we are a team of about 20 at this point. I still think it's funny because something about our outward presence in the world, I think makes people think we're a way bigger business than we are. So we still, you know, we still get the phone call where someone says, hello, may I speak to your HR department? And I like put the phone down for a second. And I'm like, hello, HR, right? Like it's still me. Um, you know, so so we're still working on growing and making sure we have the right people in the right seats. But that's been such an important lesson for me. I think as an early entrepreneur, I was so afraid of the overhead of hiring people that I took too long to take that leap. And if I could go back in time and tell my younger entrepreneurial self, I would have said, do that sooner, right? Because, you know, in the early years, I did do too much and I took on too much. And, you know, I think we could have grown more and sooner and faster than we even have if we put more people in the right positions earlier. And, and we're, you know, that's still an evolution for us. We're still growing our team and we're always looking at like, you know, wh- where are the holes? 
what, what do we need to fill? So we're still sort of in a growth phase. And in many ways, you know, we, we operate like a startup, even though we've been around <laughs> for, you know, we've been like a, a, a business making money for almost eight years now. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would say start off saying yes to everything. I, I think you can't be precious as so an early entrepreneur. Yeah, you're yeah. ready to say, yeah. You, you, it's a luxury, right. To be able to turn things down when, when you're, especially when you're first getting started, it's like the fact that there is something to say yes to is, is, you know, beyond a luxury. So it's awesome to have, but I think all those points are are super important for anybody thinking about like, how do they operate? Even, you know, like you said, eight years into the business, it's all those things that you just constantly want to continue to get better. And with that, as we, let me frame one thing that I think is really important because I think this this for people in this business and health space, it's still a business. It doesn't matter if you're selling doors or paint or squats, it's still the same business. And you know, you can't win business. So quit acting like you're gonna win business. You, you know, you don't win life. Like you don't do you win marriage? Do you win your fitness? Like I won fitness, I have abs on Instagram on Tuesday, and you know, 2021, I'm out. Like this doesn't ever happen. So you got to start playing like this is a long game and that it's got to be the the day-to-day work. It's got to be the relationships because you're not going to win. And if you play that short game, I'm going to win this, you're going to burn out and you're going to have a reputation for being a jerk. Yeah. You playing that, that ultra marathon forever game and just keep continuing to to chip away at it. Yeah, for sure. As we wrap up here and we'll, we'll actually, you know, get you out of here on this as you're thinking about, you mentioned Juliet, maybe a book coming out, continuing to go the product. What should folks kind of keep an eye out for? What are you guys, whether you're promoting something or just excited about it? um, What should we kind of have on the, on the radar? Yeah, I mean, we're actually putting out, there's a couple of things that are kind of in the pipeline that I'm really excited about. We're going to be launching a course just before Christmas this year called Training the Injured Athlete. And this has been a long time coming and we think is really important for coaches and personal trainers, of which there are a billion of those people. Because, you know, one of the things we learned at San Francisco Cross and we did, I think, such a great job of is, you know, people would break their arm and call us and be like, well, I need to pause my membership because I broke my arm. And then we'd say, well, don't you have three other limbs? Like, keep coming to the gym. And our coaches and staff became experts at being able to train people with a variety of injuries. And then on top of that, we started an adaptive athletics program at San Francisco CrossFit. So we were really able to see what's possible with, you know, without, you know, every single thing functioning perfectly. So we're really excited about that course because I think it's so needed. And we or, wanted- you know, Hey, you've torn your ACL and you see a physical therapist twice a week. By the What's way, that's next? that's incomplete. You know, there's no way in two 30-minute sessions with your physical therapist twice a week right. that you're going to have complete healing. So we need to bring the coaches up. And again, speaking to, we think, this untapped potential of expanding the role of the trainer, expanding the role of the coach around all these aspects of nutrition, health, wellness, performance, pain, and how do we get them competent so that they continue to work with people who are sort of transitioning out of acute care? Yeah, because we sort of think about it as a phase, right? Like you break your arm or you tear your ACL and you see your physical therapist for like six to eight weeks. But what physical therapy, and I think it's getting better as an industry has been challenged to do is get people from that end of like the acute care back to normal. There's been this void there. Um, And that's what we want to fill in by training coaches to say, okay, you've got this, you know, post ACL guy, he's seen his physical therapy for six weeks. And now how can you get him back to whatever he wants to be as an athlete? So that's the first thing we're, we're going to be launching that at Thanksgiving this year. So we're really excited about that. That's been kind of a long time coming and boiling around in Kelly's brain for a while. And then the second thing is this book we're publishing. Um, we just signed a big deal with Knopf, which is a major New York publisher and it's called Built to Move. And perfect. That- right? Yeah. They have built to move and that's going to be coming out. Um, the exact date is yet to be determined, but we think it's going to be early in 2023. And we are very excited about that. I mean, that really aligns with our vision of trying to like figure out how we can take this message that we are built to move. And that that's a huge part of this fitness. And everyone piece. wants to climb Everest, but we're like, Hey, let's get everyone to base camp first. Yeah. We're trying to so get everyone. To how base do camp. we, so if mobility is what we've been talking about for a decade, as we've gotten older, we've become now hyper obsessed with this word durability. How do we remain durable and how do we have a population that doesn't just succumb to old age? It's not just wither, 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 wither. It's keep kicking ass and then, you know, dying, you know, on a Tuesday after, you know, PRing on my deadlift on Monday. So that's really what we're shooting for. And I think we have the 
the leverage and the experience now to really talk about the aggregation of behaviors and how they interact so that you can drop that in. And also that's super sustainable because ultimately this is all about behavior change for people and the promise of sport, the promise of fitness, the promise of science to actually transform society. Yeah. All of those things continuing kind of that conversation, the it's super interesting. And I think important topics that we hit on here today, if folks want to follow along and I hope that they do, what's the best place to, to get in, in touch website, social, uh, give them the full rundown. Yeah, sure. I mean, we're at the ready state.com at the ready state on Instagram, Twitter, uh, the ready state on Facebook. So easy to find. And if you want to follow what our life really looks like, cause Juliet and I actually have two children and friends, and we're not robot automatons. You can just follow Juliet Starr. Yeah, I'm at Juliet Starr, and I don't really, it's not really a professional account. I like to, like, take videos of Kelly dancing while he works out and, you know, like, what our kids are up to. So, if, you know, if that is even of the slightest interest, I'm at Juliet Starr. Awesome. Listen, I hope folks check all that out. I appreciate you two making a few minutes today. We know you're super busy. So, thanks for the, the insights and for the time. Yeah. And I just, before you go, I just want to say, say thank you for what you guys are doing. I think it's really sort of elevating consciousness about what's going on in our space. So thank you guys so much. So meta. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.